the greatest trick that the devil ever played was convincing everybody that he didn't exist. And that, on one level, is Victor Strand's. The greatest trick that Victor Strand plays is that you always expect better from him, even though he constantly keeps <laughs> delivering the worst of himself. <laughs> that you have directed several episodes of or you've directed for fear the walking dead uh, do you uh is that the place where you made your directorial debut was on was on fear yes it was it was uh episode two of season six was the first episode um i'd i'd ever directed on television and uh i had a fantastic time i think the highest compliment that our crew paid me was that they took me seriously as a director and i learned a huge amount. I probably won't know how much I learned until I um, try and do it again. Any plans to do it in the in the next season or is it sort of under wraps for now? It's up for negotiation, yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, lucky us. And con well, congratulations again on the BAFTA. We are thrilled for you. Um, Thank you very much. So so let's talk let's talk some some Morgan Jones here. Um, we we had uh, have had the opportunity over the course of doing this show here on Twitch to talk to actors who have gotten phone calls and called back to the Walking Dead universe, you know, after after they thought their character had been wrapped up, you know, prior. And, um, you know, we here on the TWD universe do a show called Rewatching Dead, where we started with the first episode, the pilot of The Walking Dead and have just made our way through, through season three. So we just revisited Clear. Um, oh, and wow. it has been such a treat for us because we keep up with fear and we watch these new episodes live. So my first question to you is as an actor, can you take me back to getting the call that not only Morgan was coming back for episodes in you know, Mothership, but where, with the conversation of, of bringing Morgan Jones to fear the walking dead, because it's such a journey for us as fans that we're privileged to go on with you. Well, they're two very huge and different conversations and happened years apart. Um, coming back to fear to do, I mean, coming back to walking dead to do clear um, was a number of conversations. So, uh, after the first season, there was talk that the character comes back in the graphic novels and Gail Ann Hurd checked in on me. She checked in on me at the end of the first season. She checked in on me at the beginning of the second season. She checked on me halfway through the second season in an attempt to bring the character back, um, either story-wise or logistics-wise. It didn't really um, happen and couldn't happen. And the first opportunity they had for that was episode 12 in season three, and that's how Clear came about. I was always up for coming back. I had a really good time doing the first episode, and um, I remember very clearly getting a um, telephone call from uh, Andy Lincoln. Um, uh, I think when they first started doing uh, conventions or the first time they did um, San Diego Comic-Con, and um, he said that one of the questions they kept on being asked at every press junket and from every member of the press is, where is Morgan and when is he coming back? And um, so a lot of, well, it's where I put the blame. Um, a, a lot of the reason for Morgan's journey is down to the fans asking that question, where is Morgan and when is he coming back? That's, uh, yeah, I mean, he, he truly is, um, he's, it, it, I, again, I mean, it's and it's not just because you're sitting here. We truly have had the privilege of going back through these episodes, and that character and your bringing him to life is something that tr it really stands out. And so, to make that leap onto fear, um, where Andy's not there, you know, your scene partner essentially is is not in 
is not going to be there. Can you talk to me about, um, and we'll get into the specifics of, of where Morgan's at, you know, currently, but can you, can you talk to me about like bringing him to this new, um, this new satellite of, of the Fear of the Walking Dead universe, if you can remember well, way back there was when. a there was a slight beat in between. So when I came back and I did Clear in season three, it was um, it was written by Scott Gimple. Um, Scott at that point was um, one of the writers. He wasn't the showrunner, um, and it was a gift of an episode. I mean, any actor would have jumped at the chance of being in that episode. It was it almost played like a one act play. Um, yeah. You know, it was me and Andy in the room and we and we shot it um, Mike, it was my first real big interaction with um, Mikey Satrogenus and um, and the way he orchestrated his crew, the way he realized how me and Andy wanted to um, uh, play this, the scenes. It was all very intuitive. It was all very it was like a dance between us all. And I loved it as a working um, relationship. So when they came back to me and said, was I interested um, when Scott became the sh showrunner? I think one of the early conversations that he had was phoning my agent to ask whether or not I was interested in coming back to the show. And a lot of it was based on the experience that, strangely, the experience I had on Clear as opposed to the experience I had first time around, even yeah. though both of them were fantastic experiences. And I said yes, and I went back and I had a great time and they wrote really well for Morgan. And at a point when I thought that his journey was probably coming to an end on Walking Dead, I think once once Negan joined the cast, there were certain yeah. points that the story had to hit because of the, um, the source material. Um, there were just certain big things that needed to happen. Alpha was coming. There were other things, right. the whisperers were coming. There were certain things that were gonna happen and my character um, was long dead in the, in the graphic novels. So I expected the conversation that I, when I was driving to Scott's house to have this conversation that he had, this meeting that he had called, I expected that conversation to be about how we ended Morgan's journey. And mm. as it turned out, Scott said, well, how about this? as an alternative and um and in all honesty i couldn't and i tried to find an actor that i could talk to who had been offered the opportunity that i had been offered to leave a flagship show to go to um a spin-off show that was already happening and i couldn't right. find one that did it so um and that was a major thing in in my decision to go and do it really i mean because it was uh, it was a rare opportunity and um, and it was like, you know, it was like going to the moon. It was like taking a risk. It was like making yourself frightened again and challenging yourself again. And that's what this character of Morgan has been doing to me and for me over and over again. And that was mostly my reasons for saying yes. Well, I, I'm so, so I, we kind of did a, an a expedited journey through Morgan Jones's, uh, on, you know, television life, but now here we are and he has had such a true journey from when we first meet him to where he's at and clear to the, you know, um, the time we spend with him on fear. So the, my question is, <sighs> How do you, I suppose it's in the writing and the directing, but can you talk to me a little bit about the experience of taking Morgan from an everyman character who has, you know, m w with the fact that he couldn't kill his wife, he could, you know, and the situation that we know happened with Dwayne to the depths of despair. Uh, and then now he is this complex, complicated, he, he's, he, holds himself almost, it feels like, to maybe a higher standard. I don't know, this journey is just so, so can you take me through the experience of, of bringing him to where he is today with respect to fear? Again, it's a bit of a dance between myself and the writers and the directors, and it's a kind of, um, uh, it's a navigation. They, they place the character in particular situations. I challenge them to put him in, uh, to not go for obvious reactions, to um, give him the difficult path. And each experience that he has, each 
adventure that he has, each encounter that he has is stuff that I kind of add into the bag of who is Morgan and um, and uh, what is his journey. But that journey is only only comes to pass by, you know, uh, what he's lived, like all of us, what he's right. lived and what he's experienced. And um, and that's how we kind of put him together. And it's 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 it's. It's been fascinating. If you had said to me when I first started on The Walking Dead that this was going to be the journey of the character that I was only supposed to do for one episode, I would have laughed in your face and been running in the opposite <laughs> direction. But um, but here we are, and he's still a character that interests me, that challenges me, um, that excites me, and um, and and um, keeps me busy. So um, I like him. I quite you know. He's become he's become a good friend of mine, has Morgan Jones. <laughs> we like him too. Well, um, let's talk a little bit about this season in particular because this season has been for me. So um, when we watch these episodes, I know they go live on AMC Plus on Thursdays, but we as the host watch them live right here, right now. So we do not have spoilers. We do not know what is you know what is around the corner. This season has been. It has been, I think, a theme running through has been hope, but there is also the just people's hopes getting dashed at the exact same time. And Morgan this season, especially in the back half, has really been such a draw. He, he has driven the promise of hope, the, the, the ambition of hope, I would say. Um, do you see in this episode... Do you see Morgan's actions motivated by hope? Do you see, or, or maybe something different? Because he's ready to kill. He's ready to sacrifice himself for what he thinks is the good of the group. So is that is that out of hope for the future, or maybe something a little different? Do you think? I uh, Morgan's journey to kind of hope has been a long and kind of torturous one for a for a long while morgan believed that he walked this earth that he carried on you know when he was in his i don't die phase mm -hmm. he believed that his life in this post-apocalyptic world was a curse and and gradually through meeting rick grimes through meeting and befriending carol through walking away from that and meeting John Dory through mm -hmm. um, falling in love with Grace and allowing himself to fall in love with Grace, that that was his ultimate act of hope. Um, no mm -hmm. more so than his hope that he could possibly help her raise her child. That was the risk he took on um, in with hope. And it's been a, a long journey there. And in losing her, in Grace losing her child and Morgan losing his best friend, John Dory, his belief in hope has been challenged, but he has taken that on board as it being his personal loss of hope. He still wants it for other people. He just, I think, believes that it's not there for him necessarily. Mm. And, um, and so, I don't think that Morgan wants to sacrifice himself. He just doesn't want to sacrifice anybody else. I don't think he can sure. take any more of a loss. He doesn't want to die. He wants to. He 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 wants to be with with Grace. He wants to be with the people that he cares about. He wants to know what the next chapter is. But if in order to get there, he would rather not face any more loss. And I think that's what drives Morgan in this episode is, is it's not about sacrificing himself in his own justification. It may be perceived like that from other people, but in his, uh, for, for himself, his, his actions are about not risking the lives of the people that he loves. I think that makes actually, uh, that makes perfect sense. Um, and I, I love that. That makes great sense. We have um, a really great question from chat. Uh, one of our uh, regular participants, Yogurt Garrel says, 
How do you feel about having a younger villain this season in Dakota? It's not something that's seen too often, and it brings an interesting dynamic to the show. And, um, you know, to your point earlier about losing John Dory and about hope for others and hope for the future, here is this child, and and because I Dakota's a child, who is sort of the anti an, antithesis of all of that, the future, right? She's supposed to be the future and she has this such a dark outlook. How has that been for you reading this material? But also, what do you think about that? And what does Morgan think about that, would you say? I, Lenny, um, think it's fantastic. I think mm -hmm. it's a real kind of challenge. I think that um, what they did with um, Colby and Virginia was fantastic because she instantly brought a um, a, a, a level of a, of a, for want of a better phrase, a baddie that actually mm -hmm. had you conflicted because it was the, you know, I think when Jeffrey Dean came on to play Negan in Walking Dead, he said that his, one of his missions was to, was for, to make the audience think if they had followed Negan from the beginning of the story, they would be on Negan's side. And yes. I thought Colby did that brilliantly. She constantly kept you guessing. She constantly challenged your perceptions of right and wrong and what she was doing. And I think that what the writers then did with Dakota was just genius because she's a child of the apocalypse. Uh, her, yeah. her only conscious living, her only conscious thoughts, her only she grew up in the apocalypse. That's all she knows. And the apocalypse built her and that's what she came out to be. And it is, the, it is on one level, it, it is Morgan's worst nightmare because for mm. a man who ultimately believes that all life is pre precious, how do you go up against a child? Um, I, I, I just think it, she's, she's his worst nightmare. And um, and I, I and and also the um, Zoe is just such a fantastic actress. I mean, she's come in at a point in a television show where you know it, people who have been at it a lot longer than her find it very difficult, and she's come in and she's landed with both feet on the ground, and she's created a three hundred and sixty degree character who has some really difficult choices to. Um, to to make and to and to bring to the audience and she does it fantastically um and i you know and i say that having witnessed it from both ends because i was when she she was introduced in the episode that i directed so that i was her first director and i um uh, have acted opposite her and on on in both positions she's she's a star I have been blown away by her. And we always make sure that when we say, oh no, Dakota, we don't like what you're doing. Like, don't, no, no, no. It's about the character because Zoe, it's not about the actor. We always distinguish that. But Zoe is breathtaking. She is so good. And it has been, John Dory was one of my favorite characters and I was very attached to him as I'm sure so many fans were. And so that dynamic, I mean, uh, it was hard, like as a fan, especially if because I didn't know what was coming. That was really tough, but she has carried it, and I am very curious to see what happens next week. That is, yeah, it was <laughs> very. Sure. I mean, losing losing John Dory, losing Garrett was hard for me on both levels. He was my character's best buddy, and he was my one of my closest friends on the job. But the only upside of that is that he will continue to be one of my closest friends. There you go. There you go. We have a special message in the chat from a user named Martini Shot. They say, Lenny, you are so kind and wonder wonderful to work with. Such a pleasure for me. Peggy Shot, aka Tess from season five, is uh, in the chat. So they are they're sending you some love. <laughs> That's very nice. She's a lovely actress, and we had we had some good times. Oh, um, so I know. Um, I know you have. Plenty of places to be, but before I let you go, my last question for you, especially after all that Morgan has been through on fear and everything we saw tonight, 
Strand. Let's, if we can, <laughs> talk about, can we talk about <laughs> Strand? <laughs> yeah. Um, this, this was, this was a doozy. This was a lot. Um, so Strand is, you know, <clears throat> I would argue sort of serves as a foil for Morgan in this episode, um, and has been kind of throughout the season. Um, and there's a lot of like ideological conflict between Morgan and Strand. Um, so do you see this conflict as sort of the inevitable culmination of their relationship? I mean, can there ever, where, where what, how do you see, how does Morgan see what happened tonight with Strand and how, for somebody who's trying to believe in the future, how do they go forward from this? If there's a forward, um, that's, a, <laughs> that's such a fantastic question that I'm, uh, um, I'm not sure I can answer in its totality. Um, what I can say is that um, there's a film called Usual Suspects and there's a line in it in which they say that the greatest gift, I mean, the greatest trick that the devil ever played was convincing everybody that he didn't exist. And that, on one level, is Victor Strand's. The greatest trick that Victor Strand plays is that you always expect better from him, even though he constantly keeps <laughs> delivering the worst of himself. <laughs> Um, but you you still keep expecting better, and um, and I I loved the um, uh, the interplay between um, Morgan and Strand in this episode, and each time when they come across each other, because the thing about them is that they're both men who are operating on their own moral compasses. It's just that their own moral compasses are complete opposites to each other. So they have this weird dynamic of seemingly understanding each other and getting each other, but just always at the wrong time and missing each other. And, and that no more so than in this episode. And each time, you know, you would expect after Victor throw, you know, throws Morgan to the walkers, that when Morgan, Morgan comes back to him, that they would have it out. But they don't because there are bombs about to drop and, and they, have to, they have to deal with the thing bigger than the two of them. And then at the end, when, you know, the, bombs are in the, the bomb is in the air, um, you would think that that would be a good point for Morgan to deal with Strand, but he can't because there's something bigger about that's going on and he can't care about Terry, about Teddy. He can't care about Strand at that particular moment in time. He's got other things uh, on his mind, but I, there is something coming up in um, the finale where I think in a weird way, Victor pays Morgan a huge compliment, but he does it in a way that only Strands can do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> that is both and very vague and very specific. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I but we I know exactly what you're getting at, even though I have no idea what it actually like literally yeah. will be. Um, it's well, you know, a, I, it's such a strand move that you it, you you just go wait what, and <laughs> um, and you you do that all the way until. Victor lets you off the hook. It's um, it's a, it's a genius move on the part of the writers, and it is, apps as always, absolutely beautifully played by Coleman Dominga. Oh my gosh, what a what a tease, what a setup! I mean, so good, so good. Um, Lenny, this has been um, a wonderful conversation, and thank you for being so generous with your time, especially on the eve of receiving such awards and accolades uh we we offer you once again our biggest congratulations and we love the work that you do in the walking dead universe in front of the camera and behind the camera so thank you again for for chatting with us and for chatting with chat we we are so thrilled to see you and to have you not at all i had a fantastic time i'm glad i could do it mm -hmm.